The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Now for a different, uh, entirely different type of issue that has more to do with recognition, some psychophysics, some computer vision, but you will see at the end the motivation was really to be able to be able to recognize and understand really complicated things that are happening in natural images. Now when we look at, at objects in the world, uh, people have worked a lot on object recognition and we can recognize, we can recognize well complete objects, but we can also recognize um, a very limited configuration of objects. So we are very good at using limited information if this is what's available in order to recognize what's in there. And this is some arbitrary collection. I guess you can recognize all of them. Some of them, if you think about a person or even a face, this is a very small part of a face. Everybody, I guess, knows what it is, right? Uh, it's not even a recognizable, well-delineated part like an eye. You see a part of a person here. We know what it is, right? We don't, uh, I mean, everybody recognizes this and so on. Um, now, I think that the ability to be able to get all the information out, even from a limited region, plays an important role in understanding images. And let me motivate it by, by one example. I'll go back to it at the end. Uh, when we look at these images, we know what's happening. Uh, we know what the action here is. All the people are performing the same action. They're all drinking, even drinking from a bottle, right? But the images, as images, are very different. If you, if you look at each image, if you stored one image and you try to recognize another image based on the first one, it will be difficult. The variability here can be huge. But if you focus on where the action really takes place, the most informative part where most of the answer is already given to you of what's happening here, which is where the bottle is docked into the mouth, uh, you can see that now these diverse images becomes virtually almost a copy of one another, right? They're almost the same. So if you manage to um, understand this and extract the most informative part, and although it's limited and so on, uh, the variability will be much, much reduced. The variability here is much, much reduced compared to variability that you have in the entire image. So most of the other stuff is much less relevant, but this is where the information is concentrated. And in the limited, uh, restricted configuration, uh, recognition will be much easier and will generalize much better from one situation to another because of this principle of highly reduced variability in the, uh, uh, in the limited image. So we became. Uh, interested, as I say, it's, as you see, it's useful, uh, but it's also uh, to, to deal with small images and still recognize them, or limited images, uh, it's, uh, you'll see it's much more, there are some very challenging issues. And I want to discuss it a little bit and then uh, also discuss what it's good for a little bit more. I will show you some human studies. What we wanted to see is what are the sort of the minimal images that people can still recognize. Uh, we examined some computational models and I will give you sort of, will not keep the secret. It turns out that well-performing current schemes, including deep, deep networks, cannot deal well with uh, such minimal images. And uh, from this, I want to discuss some implications in terms of representations in our system, brain processing, and um, things like this. And quite a number of people have been involved in this. Uh, here are the names. Um, uh, some of them are at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, and a few, uh, two, uh, Lila is here, at the Lila Isaac, is, she's here in the, uh, in the summer school, and a student, Yena Han, uh, uh, at MIT, doing some brain imaging uh, on this, which I will mention uh, very, very briefly. So I'll start with the human study. We're looking for minimal sort of atomic things in recognition. And the, the experiment goes like this. You show a subject an image and ask them to recognize it. Uh, just produce a label. So this is a dog. If they say a dog, they recognized it. And if they recognized it correctly, uh, we generate five descendants uh, from this initial image. If this image was, say, 50 by 50 pixels, and 
tell you about pixels in a minute, but say it's 50 by 50 pixels, we make it somewhat smaller, we reduce it because it's still not minimal, and we reduce it in five ways. We either crop it in at one of the four corners to create, say, a 48 by 48 image uh, by taking two pixels from this corner here or this corner here and so on, so four descendants. And we generate, we also take the full image, keep it as, as is, we do not re uh, crop it, uh, we just reduce the resolution. So you re we resample it, uh, so some details start to become lost. Instead of 50 by 50 pixel, it's also full image, but 40, 48 by 48. And then we give each one of these images, well now we have five, we give each one, this is beginning to expand as a tree, each one of the five is given again to a subject. If they recognize it, again, five descendants are being generated, and we explore the entire tree until we find all the sub-images which are um, uh, minimal and can be recognizable um, in this original configuration. Uh, now, this is challenging psychophysically in terms of number of subjects because you can we use a subject only once. Because if you show a subject this and he recognizes it, if you show him the same subject, a reduced image, uh, he will recognize the image based on his previous exposure. So you, don't, you do not want to use him again. So you don't use him again and you show the other images to, to new subjects. And this requires a large number of subjects. So 15,000 subjects uh, participated in this experiment online by Mechanical Turk together with some laboratory controls to see that they are doing the right thing and how it compares with the same experiment done under laboratory conditions and, and so on. So the way we define the minimal image for recognition is in this tree, here is an image. The image, suppose the, this image is recognizable, and then we create the five descendants, and none of the descendants is recognizable. So this is recognizable, nothing here is recognizable. So it's minimal because you can no longer reduce it either by resolution going here or by reducing the size. Any manipulation like this, we make it un unrecognizable. Uh, technically, when I'm in my measuring, if I'm using numbers that the image is 50 pixels or 35 pixels and so on, what I, it's actually well defined. I mean not the pixels on the screen. You can take the image and make it bigger or smaller on, this, on the screen. But the number of sampling points in the image is well defined. When you give me an image, uh, a particular image, I can tell you how many sample points you need in order to capture this image. Technically, for those of you who know it, it's twice the, if you do a Fourier transform and take the, uh, twice the um, um, cutoff frequency, the highest frequency in the Fourier spectrum. This is by the sampling theorem of Shannon. This is the number of points you need in order to. Uh, so when I say that the image was 35 pixels, I don't really care. Uh, you can make it somewhat smaller or, or uh, larger on the screen by interpolation. It doesn't change the information content. It's well defined. Uh, notion mathematically how many points are in this uh, discrete points or sampling points are in these in this, uh, images. So an, a very interesting thing that we, we found um, when we found these minimal images is that there is a sharp transition when you get to, lev to the level of the minimal images. So um, you go down and you recognize it. Uh, and then there is a sharp transition that uh, um, it suddenly becomes unrecognizable, uh, basically to, uh, to the large majority of people. So it can change a little bit, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you some examples for you to uh, try to see how these minimal images look like at the recognizable level, at the unrecognizable. This is the recognizable level, this is the unrecognizable level. So to show it to you as examples here, as subjects, I will show you first the unrecognizable one, the one which people find on average more difficult to recognize. And if you recognize it, raise your hand. Don't say what you see, because this will influence other people. Just raise your hand if you recognize the image. Uh, and then I'll show you the more recognizable one, and let's see if more hands show up, if the, the distinction between the recognizable and unrecognizable holds here. I'll just show you a couple of examples from the, uh, OK, so I'll, OK, so this is the one which is supposed to be difficult to recognize. If you see what it is, if you know what's the object, raise your hand. OK, don't say what it is. We have two, two. Let's see here. OK, certainly more hand. What do you see? What do you think? Should I say? OK, now you can say, because a horse, right. So let me show them side by side. 
So you see that it's very difficult to recognize what's not recognized. This is, you, you can see the statistic, this is recognized by 93% of the subjects, 30 subjects saw each one of these images, 93 recognized this, 3% recognized this. And you look at the image and you see that there are very, very similar images and it drops from 90 to 3%. So you can see the two images and you can see the similarity and you can see the large, uh, the large drop. Uh, this is part of the entire tree which is being um, explore, this is the father, this is the recognized one, uh, the, the minimal image, uh, and you can see that even reduce the resolution, which is really not a big manipulation, but this is a drop in performance, and you can see all the, uh, uh, so we used 50% as our criterion, so the parent should be recognized at higher, this should be recognized at lower, but typically the, 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 the jump is, the, is, very, is very sharp. Let's try two more or something, and then just, just, just for fun. If you can recognize it, raise your hand. Okay, let's try nobody, for just for the record. Okay, look around, you can see many. What do you see? A boat, right. So you, you can see the two images, so 80% on this, 0% <coughs> here. Uh, and you can see that what's really missing here is the tip here. And clearly, this tip is a... Uh, there are many contours in this image, but this particular corner, sharp, uh, makes an enormous difference, and it goes from 80% to, to 0%. Uh, okay, let me skip. Just one more, and uh, okay, let me skip this. This is somewhat easier, okay. This is some, some okay, at least one, two, maybe three, okay. How about this one? Everybody, I think, or maybe we are missing one. So again, you can see that the difference, if you look at the two, there is a difference, and it's this thing here, but it's not a very big part of the image. It's crucial, you know, it's, uh, you, you have to be trained on this. You have, it's part of your representation, it's important. You go from almost 90% to 15%, roughly, and it's, so it's an important. So you can see that the drop is typically very, very sharp, and um, uh, <coughs> It's also, into, you know, the, the sharp transition is also interesting in the sense that if it drops from, like the whole, from 90% to 10 to 3% or even here, it also says that we all carry around in our head a v very similar representation because if each one of us, based on the history uh, uh, and ex visual experience would uh, be less or more sensitive to various features, then we will, we will not find this sharp transition. Different people will lose it at different, uh, different points in the, uh, in the manipulation, but at 90%, 90% of the people, roughly everybody recognizes it. You m remove a feature and it goes to 3%, so everybody is using the same uh, um, or very similar representation, which I find somewhat surprising, at least for some of these images, you know, that uh, we, d we don't all have the same kind of experience with horses or with battleships or things like that, and still the representation is very strikingly similar across individuals. The experiment was done on 10 different objects. These are the initial objects. So I showed you the object uh, at the beginning of the hierarchy, and then you start the manipulation to discover all the uh, uh, minimal images uh, uh, inside them. Um, and here, so we ended up with a very nice catalog. We have a database of all the minimal images in all of these 10 images and all of the, the children, the unrecognizable ones. So in terms of modeling and in terms of exploring visual features and what is necessary in order to recognize and so on, there is a very rich data set here of all the minimal images in all of these 10 images. Here are some more um, pairs of recognizable and unrecognizable. Okay, we already saw this in principle, but just to show some, uh, in some cases it's pretty clear what may be going on. For example, this is horse legs, the, 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 the front legs of the horse. This uh, seems to be important. You can see that very often it's uh, tremendously small in this fly image, very small differences, very hard to pinpoint, and it, it's drastic or in this, in the uh, eyeglasses. Something here is missing a little bit, but very small things in very reliable way cause this uh, dramatic change. As was mentioned here, somebody mentioned, uh, let's say, the inflection in point. You can manipulate psychophysically a bit more. For example, here, 
this was a, uh, this is another version of a minimal image. Uh, it was cropped at two locations. You can crop only the left side, or you can crop only the, the, the bottom side, and you can try to see what makes a difference. So you can really <coughs> zoom in on the, on, the critical, on the critical features. In terms of number of pixels, the impression is that it's surprisingly small. So I guess you can recognize that this is an eagle, this is an airplane, and the number of pixels, um, you know, your retina, your, you know, those of you who know vision, your retina is, has 120 million pixels. The, uh, uh, the fovea, which is the area of very high acuity, um, is two degrees. It's about 250 by 250, 250 by 200 pixels. This is the area, the central area of high acuity. But you can recognize things with, I don't know, 15, 20, pixels, it's one-tenth of your, of your fovea. It's tiny, tiny in terms of, you can make it larger, but in terms of uh, how much visual information, it's, uh, I find it surprising that you need very, very little. It's also interesting that it's, it's very useful in the sense that it's, it's very redundant. If you, if you have the capacity, if you have a visual system that can recognize individually each one of these minimal images, and in fact they can be recognized on their own, then a full image like this contains a high number of uh, partially overlapping minimal images. Some of them are large. You can see each one of these frame, colored frame, is a minimal image uh, shown not necessarily at the right resolution. Uh, you can reduce the resolution of things. Um, but you can see that some images are essentially low resolution uh, representations of the entire object, like almost the entire eagle, but some of them just contain the, uh, something relatively small around the, uh, uh, around, the <coughs> around the head and the eye. For the eye region, you can see that some, you can get a low resolution, again, thing of almost everything, but you can just the corner of the eye and things like that are enough. Uh, we find in general, it seems that things that are related to humans, you have a large number of um, these minimal, minimal images. So um, they provide a sensitive tool to compare representations to see what's missing in the sub-image, uh, which made the uh, uh, image become unrecognizable. So we call them sometimes uh, this acronym, minimal recognizable configuration. We, we call them configuration, but not images, mm -hmm. not parts, or some, not objects, because they're not objects and not parts because, as we saw in the examples, they do not have to be well delineated parts. They are more like local configuration. But anyway, minimal, minimal images. Um, and um, the next thing that we did is we were wondering if this kind of behavior, that uh, the ability to recognize this the ability to recognize these images from such minimal information requires, it, it places an interesting challenge or an inter interesting test of a recognition system because you really have to extract and use all the available information. By definition, this is minimal. If you do not use all the information that's in this minimal image, uh, then you don't have the minimal information. You, are, you have less than that and you will fail. So a system that uh, is not good enough will fail on these minimal images or the ability to uh, recognize them means that you really can suck out all the, uh, all the relevant information out. So we were wondering what will happen if we show it to various computational uh, uh, algorithms uh, that performs well, perform well on full images. What will happen when you challenge them with things which are by nature designed to be non-redundant? Uh, so here is, a, I will do it, it's not a computer vision uh, school, I will not go too much through the details of the computational scheme, but just to show you what, what was happening. And, and the bottom line is that they're not doing a, a good job. Two things happen. First of all, when you train a computational system, you do not see the same drop that you see here, that it recognizes one and doesn't recognize the other. You don't have a drop in recognition, the, 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 this uh, sort of phase transition that characterizes the human visual system is not reproduced in any of the current uh, recognition systems, including deep, deep network and any, any other ones. And secondly, they are not very good at recognizing them. Regardless of the gap that uh, there is a sharp transition or not, they do not get good recognition results um, 
on, on these minimal images. They do not suck all the necessary information. So in the full images, um, it's like we had a, an image of a side view of a plane. So we are training on airplane. Uh, you can think about deep network. We actually try the whole uh, range of uh, good classifiers. And in all of these good classifiers, those of you who are not in vision probably got enough um, at the beginning of this um, summer school that they have a feeling for a classifier in computer vision. It's a system, that uh, algorithm, a system, a scheme that you give it training images. You don't have to specify. You don't tell it what to look for. You just give it lots of images and tell them all these are of the same class. And then it calibrates itself and adjusts parameters and so on. And then you, you give it new images. And the system is supposed to tell you if it belong, it's a new member uh, of the same class or not. So in this case, we train the system giving them full side views of uh, airplane. But then we gave them uh, 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 just the, uh, the tails compared to random patches taken from non-images. The question is, do they reliably can tell you that this is a tail of an airplane, uh, part of the previous uh, class, or they will be confused and they will give even higher score to things which do not come from airplane at all. Uh, so uh, we started this when deep networks were still not the leaders, and we had some other things like DPM, and including HMAX, which is a very good model of the human visual system and performs very well. Uh, uh, and so we included it as well, and deep network as well. Uh, this is the HMAX. This is convolutional neural networks. Uh, you probably got the idea, it's just worth pointing. I, I find it interesting in the computer vision community that it's a, you have Olympic Games every year. It's something which is very structured and very competitive and very nice in this regard. That, for, that uh, there is the Pascal challenge and the ImageNet challenge, and it's well run. And people who think that they have a better algorithm than others uh, can submit an entry, can submit an algorithm. Everybody gets training images that are distributed uh, publicly, but there are secret images used for testing. And you can train your algorithm on the uh, available data. Everybody uses the same data. Uh, and then you su submit your algorithm, and the algorithm is run by the central committee on the test images. And the results are published, and everybody knows who is number one, who is number two. You have a gold medal and a silver model and a medal. And a it's, uh, it's very competitive, and it, it's, it's, um, in some sense, it's doing very good things. It's sort of driving the performance up. Uh, it also has some negative uh, effects on the, I think, on the way uh, uh, things are, are being done. One negative is it's very difficult to come up with an entirely new scheme, which explores a completely new idea, because initially, before you fine-tune it, it will not be at the level of the uh, uh, high-performing um, uh, winners. And until it establishes itself as a winner, it will not get credit. So it, it, it sort of becomes a little bit conservative in this, uh, in this regard, which is the, uh, the unfortunate part. So as I told you, and I will not go in great detail, the two basic outcomes is that uh, the gap between the recognizable and unrecognizable, these two bars are the gap for human vision, uh, that uh, a whole group of horse uh, images, the parents are highly recognizable, the, the, the children, uh, the offsprings are, are not recognizable, very large drop, this drop is not uh, re recaptured in, uh, uh, in this model, in any, any of the model. If you have a, a deep network or you have one of these classifiers, what is recognized and not recognized depend on the threshold. You can decide that it gives you a number and it says that I have this and this confidence that this is a, belongs to the class. So what we did here is that we tried to match. Uh, we had a class of images and people recognized them at 80% recognition. So we uh, put the threshold in the artificial, the computer vision system at such a level that it recognized correctly 80% of, uh, 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 of, uh, uh, of the minimal images, so you match them. Uh, and then we looked at how many of the sub-images it uh, uh, passed the threshold. And you get, this is for Dietnepper, that instead of a gap, you actually got an 
uh, anti-GAP, it actually recognized a few more, but this should not confuse you. It, should, it does not mean that the deep network did better than humans. It actually did much worse than humans, although the bars here uh, are higher. And there is this, the following. You can always, even in a very bad classifier, you can get 80% recognition by just lowering the threshold, and then 80% of the class examples will exceed the threshold. The question is how many just garbage image, non-class images will also pass the threshold at the same time. If you get 80% of the class, but also lots and lots and lots of completely um, uh, false positive, negative images, non-class images are also saying I'm an airplane, then that's bad performance. So just the, the, these high bars do not say anything. Um, the, uh, the actual recognition levels were, uh, uh, were uh, were very low, we can see here for deep networks that this high bar is the performance on new airplanes. So for airplanes, it did very well. But the percent correct that it did on minimal images was 3% or 4% or very, very, very low. So it did very bad um, recognition on the minimal, on the minimal images. Um, so recognition of minimal images does not emerge by training any of the existing model that I know in in the world, including not the uh, um, deep network models. Now, the, te the second test was, as was asked here, is that we, uh, we did another large test. All of these things actually were a lot of effort and, and, and time consuming, because now we have this. This was in the original test was a minimal image. I don't know. This was a minimal image. Then we, we collected a range of tails of uh, uh, planes like this for many other airplanes, and we would run another Turk uh, 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 experiment, which was pretty large, because we wanted to verify that each one of these patches that we added to our, uh, uh, to our test, and we were going to use for testing recognition, was indeed a minimal image for recognition. So each one of these patches, and there were 60 of those, um, we ran on a, um, psychophysically, and we saw that it's recognizable, and if you uh, make it small, if you try to reduce it, it's unrecognizable. So each one of these is individually also a minimal image. So here we did training and testing on, uh, so this is some examples of this. Uh, so here are various images of fly, and each one of them was tested on 30 uh, subjects on the Mechanical Turk. And the results are, that in terms of correct recognition, there is a substantial improvement from 3% to 60%. Uh, but 60% is not very large. People recognize them, uh, 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 six, I should say, it's a, you should look at the false alarm. The number of errors, I will show you later, the number of errors that even after training on minimal images, the, uh, the number of uh, uh, the uh, the performance of the, the deep network and all the other models on the minimal images uh, is far worse than human recognition level, human performance on the same images. So it's not just the, uh, the gap is not rep uh, reproduced, even training with minimal images, uh, uh, the uh, performance is not, is not reproduced, the errors or the accuracy is far worse in the uh, uh, in all the models, including deep network, compared to, uh, to human vision. So these systems uh, do not do it. It remains to be, you can always ask, what happens if I train it with 100,000 uh, uh, images and I add and add more and more examples? This we couldn't, uh, this becomes more and larger. But my, my, with the experiments we've done, which are quite extensive, it does not, it does not begin to approach um, uh, human accuracy. Uh, humans are much, are, uh, are much better. And I'll show you, I think it's not just a competition, who does, who does better, I think there is something deeper there, and that's what I want to go next. Let me skip some, these are the error comparison, and you can see, just to show, in a lot of different examples, zero, zero errors for humans, 17% errors in the deep networks and so on, so there are big, big differences. Um, okay. The, A related thing, which I think gets to the heart of what's going on, that uh, humans can do with these minimal images and model at the moment cannot, is that we do not only, we not only recognize these images and say this is 
a man, this is an eagle, this is a horse. Once we recognize it, although the image itself is sort of atomic in the sense that you reduce it and recognition goes away, but once you recognize it, we can recognize sort of subatomic particles. We can recognize things inside it. So if this is a person, we asked again in the psychophysical test to you know, tell us what you see uh, uh, inside the image in various, using various methodologies which I'll not go into. But people recognize this. This is a person uh, in a tie and suit, for those of you who could not recognize it. But once people recognize it, they say this is the neck of the person, this is the tie, this is the, uh, um, <coughs> uh, this is the knot of the tie, this is part of the jacket, and so on and so forth. I mean, they recognize a whole lot of details, semantic, internal uh, details inside. If they see this is the horse, sorry, the contrast is, is low, but they see the ear and the other ear and the, and the uh, and the eye and the, and the mouse, but if you reduce the image, they lose the recognition completely. Once they recognize it, they recognize a whole lot of uh, structure inside. And I think that the structure by itself is the more interesting part, because when we, we don't want to say a horse, we don't want to see a car, we want to know where the car door is, where the knob is, we want to recognize all the internal details. But the ability to recognize all of these internal details is automatically, it's also helping you with improving the recognition and rejecting sort of false detections. Because these are images that deep network thought that are good images of a man in a suit. But once you dive inside and you say, where exactly is the neck and where exactly is the tie and is it the right structure that I expect, the answer is that it's uh, not quite appropriate. And you can use that so that this internal interpretation is, first of all, the more important goal of vision. But in addition, once you do it, um, you can uh, reject things that uh, appeared based on the co coarser structure to be correct. Um, and uh, in, this, uh, in this way, you can get the, uh, the correct recognition. And in this, for this reason, my prediction is that it will be very difficult to get it with current deep network because what you need is not only to get the label out but to be able to dive down and get the correct interpretation and inspect it and it has some properties what the, the, the tie, the, the knot in the tie is slightly wider than the, the part under it and so on. So you have to check for the, you know these things and you check for them um, and if you don't do it then the recognition will remain, remain limited. Now when you look at it and you say, okay, and we try to s develop algorithm which will actually dive in and will do the inter internal interpretation and will do them correctly and will reject false, al false alarms and so on, it turns out that this is an interesting business. You have to be very accurate and some of the properties and relations that you need to extract are very specific to certain categories and are very precise. For example, this was selected by Deep Network as a very good example of a horse head. And it's basically the right, it, it does have the right shape. But for example, people reject it. We asked, we asked, people did not accept it as a horse head. And they said, for example, that these lines are too straight. It's a, it looks like a man-made uh, part rather than a part of a, of a, real, of a real animal. That, that was a, a repeating answer, for example. But deviation, how straight is it, and so on, this is uh, a bit tricky. And also, it didn't have quite the ear that you, you expect here. So we think that the kind of feature that you need in order to do this internal interpretation of interest depends on relatively complicated properties and relations that you don't want to spend time and effort doing in a bottom-up way all over, the, uh, uh, the <coughs> all over the, the entire visual field. If certain two contours move smoothly or in a corner, or if something is really straight only semi-straight. I mean, to do all of these computations, my, my hunch is to do all of these complicated things, um, you need them only in a small, you need some specific ones for some specific classes at some specific locations. So the right way to do, uh, uh, to do this uh, kind of computation, the right architecture seems to me a combination of bottom-up and top-down processing, and we know that in the visual system this is a diagram of the visual system, which is suppo supposed to show that we have lots of connections going up, but also a lot of connections going down. And the suggestion that I would like to, to put up, and I think it's what's 
happening here is that we have something like deep network that does an initial generic classification. It's bottom up, it has some kind of, uh, it was trained on many categories. It is not sensitive to all of these small and informative things that you need for internal classification. And it proposes uh, a lot of, it gives you initial, class, initial recognition, which is okay. It's especially okay when you have a complete object and not something challenging like a, like, like a minimal image, because you may be wrong on a couple of the minimal images, uh, but you have 20 of them in each object, so if two are wrong, it's not too bad. So under many circumstances, you'll be okay in terms of general, general recognition. But what this does is it doesn't complete the process, but it sort of triggers the application of something which is much more class specific, that it says, oh, it looks like a horse. Let's check if it has, or let's now complete the interpretation. It's not just a validation, but you really want to know where is the eye, where is the ear, where is the mouse, and so on. You want to know maybe if the mouse is open or closed. You want to feed the horse, you want to pet the horse. I mean, when you interact with objects, all of these things are important. So you continue your understanding of the visual scene, but this is not this generic bottom-up recognition, but you are looking for specific structures that you, um, uh, you learned about when you interacted with these objects before, and then you test specific things. I and mean, if uh, where is the eye, it's, this should be a round thing roughly here, and so on and so forth. So these are more extended routines that uh, you are applying to the, uh, um, uh, to the detected to, to the detected region, um, sort of directed from above, and you know what kind of feature to, um, uh, to look for uh, at different locations within the, uh, within the minimal image. And this kind of ongoing continuing interpretation is not just inside internally to the what you succeeded to recognize, but start to spread over the entire image. For example, if you look at this image, what do you see here in, in, in this image here? Anyone want to suggest what we see here? Sorry? Woman's face. What is the woman doing? Drinking. Right. So it's a woman drinking. For those of you who managed to recognize, this is the woman, and she's drinking for a, from a cup. Uh, now, we tested it. The woman is actually a minimal image. It's, uh, if you remove the cup, you show this image, people recognize it at a relatively high. Nobody recognizes this as a glass when you, uh, um, when you just show the, the glass on its own. We think that you start the actual recognition process in your head starts with recognizing the, what is recognizable on its own, sort of the minimal configuration, which you know what it is. You don't need help. You don't need context. You don't need anything. This is a woman. This is the mouse, and you can continue from there in the same way that you can recognize internally that this is the, this is the nose and the nostril, and this is the upper lip and lower lip. You can, in the same way that you can uh, guide your interpretation process internally, you can also say that the thing which is docked at her mouse is, uh, uh, is a glass. Some results from the, this is, has been implemented by Guy Ben Yosef, who is also now a part of CBMM and uh, this internal interpretation begins to work interestingly well. Um, we started to do at MIT some MEG studies because if this is correct, if the interpretation process and the, the correct recognition of minimal images and the following um, full interpretation process is driven by, or it it's, uh, requires for completion, it requires the uh, triggering of top-down processing that we, we could see it in uh, using the right kind of imaging. In, in this case, the, in, in a, uh, we started to do minimal images in a, uh, MEG, uh, MEG images with MEG is, I think you, was MEG already mentioned here in any of the talk? So MEG, as you know, it uh, doesn't have very good spatial resolution. It's not like fMRI, but it has very good temporal resolution. Uh, and what uh, uh, Lila and, uh, uh, was, was led by, <coughs> uh, by Leila Isik. And what we've done here is trying to let subjects in the MEG recognize minimal images. And we took the uh, electrodes from the MEG and trained a decoder. The decoder is trained to say whether or not the image contains, uh, say, uh, an eagle in this case, and we had uh, various images. And the question is, we can follow the performance of the uh, 
computational decoder that tries to say now the image, now the electrode, the pattern of electrodes allow me to deduce that there is an eagle in the, uh, in, in the image. And we see that the decoder is successful at, you can see here, at about 400 milliseconds. This is late for vision. The initial bottom-up initial recognition is more like 150 or something like this. Uh, and we also get the same results when we do psychophysics, that in normal images, um, you can recognize them. At, uh, uh, you can get good recognition after, uh, say, exposure of 100 milliseconds followed by a mask. In, uh, to recognize correctly at the human level, at the, to get to the human level uh, that we get uh, with minimal images, you have to give enough time, which we suspect that this enough time is uh, to allow the application of the top-down uh, interpretation routine. And it seems if you don't give enough time, then people degenerate and become deep networks, and uh, you get this, the same kind of performance roughly. But this is all still unpublished and uh, um, still running and we need more subjects and all of this is uh, looking in the right direction and looking in providing support for top-down processing for this. And this, by the way, for it, it's interesting methodologically because it's very difficult with real images. It's so rich and you get so much information already in the wave going up and because of this redundancy that even if uh, you make 20% error, it doesn't really matter because you have redundancy, you have many, multiple uh, sufficient minimal images within any object and so on. So it's very difficult to tease out uh, the effect of where exactly the top-down Im information starts, where do you need it, where, you, where exactly you fail if you, do, if you don't have it. So we think we, you need it for this internal interpretation and for the correct recognition of minimal images. And here you can start seeing good signals in the, in the MEG. It provides you sort of a tool that uh, uh, is pretty unique and allows you to do, uh, to do these things. So let me add with very informal thing, but where I think this is going, I think that when you look at difficult images like action recognition, which we discussed below, many things that we do depend not on sort of course label, label of there is a person there, or there is an airplane, or there is a dog, but really things depend on very fine details of the internal interpretation. And so if you can turn off the, what I think is the top-down part of class-specific top-down processes, I think that many of these fine distinctions that we make all the time, and it's what vision is all about, vision is not about giving uh, course categories, uh, will go away, and so these things will become more and more an important part of vision. Let me just uh, look at this variability in action recognition, but let me show you some specific examples. Uh, this is something that confuses current classifiers, that in both of them it seems that the person is drinking. This was uh, uh, because there is, you know, a person, there is a bottle, and the bottle is close to the, to the mouth, so the person is, is drinking at this rough level of description, but obviously here this person is drinking, this person is pouring, right? Here is something very different. Is this person drinking at the moment? Yes or no? No, why not? She's holding a cup and uh, it's not, far, you know, maybe on the way to the, we know that she's not drinking, right? But why exactly not? And again, this is something that is picked up as drinking by many recognition systems, but it's, something is wrong here. All of these things, these are different objects and different actions that the people are performing. This is drinking from a straw, this is smoking, and this is brushing their teeth. But this depends on, you know, you have to go to the right location and decide exactly what's happening there. It's a, the kind of thing that uh, we do all the time. Uh, some more challenges, this is just sort of informal challenges to show you how we can deal with fine interpretation of uh, details of interest in the image. What is this arrow point pointing at? Sorry? Above. Yeah, but above the bottle, there is something else there. Sorry, yeah. Fingers, Fingers right. Uh, let's see, just play in this. What is this arrow pointing at? Zipper. Zipper. Let's see, this is, here are two challenging things. Here are two arrows. What, what is this one pointing at? Sorry, right, not next to the cup, right. It's also, this is really challenging. Let's see if something, what is this one pointing at? 
tray, not uh, so the tray, think about it, it exists, but you match it with this thing here in order to make sure, to know that it's, it's, a, it's a tray. It's not something that will be easily picked up, but I, I mean, I'm looking for difficult things which are a little bit challenging and you say, ah, I can get it. But this, I think that this level of detail, interpreting the fine details in images in a top-down fashion happens all the time. Is this person smoking? Of course not, and we are not fooled by it, and we immediately zoom on the right things, and it really, all the information is here at the end of the, uh, so, and so on, so on, and so forth. I mean, we were looking at dealing visually with social interactions, understanding the social interactions between agents in the, and again, it's very difficult to do correctly, and it depends on subtle, subtle things. I mean, you can get uh, something rough okay, but, uh, for example, is this sort of an intimate hug or is this just cordial hug of people who are not uh, very, we know exactly what's going on, right? And uh, it turns out that the, the features are not that easy to get. Uh, this was uh, picked up incorrectly by something that we designed for people hugging. Uh, and it's not very far from people hugging, but it doesn't fool, doesn't fool us, right? They're not, they're not really hugging. On social interaction, we know interactions even between non-human uh, agents uh, I mean, this interaction, is this a threatening interaction or a friendly interaction? What do you think? Yeah, all right, I think so too. Anyway, I think that all of these things that we can do, and I think that vision is about this. It's not about looking at this room and saying that this is a computer and this is a chair. It's about understanding the situation and making fine judgments and interacting with objects. Um, and, um, uh, in fact, we are looking at uh, the past part of we are doing at CBMM. We are looking at the problem of asking questions about images. So we want a system that you can give it a, an image and a question, and then uh, we want the system to be able to process the, way, the image in such a way that will give you a good answer to the question. And this is interesting because it means that it's not just a generic pipeline of running the image through a pipeline, sort of fixed. Uh, sequence of operations, but depending on what you're interested in, the whole visual process should be directed in a particular way to produce just the relevant answer. And we looked at, uh, uh, at a set of, uh, with a student, we looked at a set of some 600 questions that we gave um, people on the Mechanical Turk images, and they say, imagine some questions about these images, ask some questions about these images, and they came up with some images. We looked at them, and an informal observation, initial observation, is that most of these questions that people invented to ask about images, you needed some things which depended on precise internal interpretation of the details. So it's things, it's things that come up all the time. You have to dive into the image and analyze the subtle uh, cues that will tell you that these are not hugging, and this is not threatening, and this is not a an intimate hug and so on and so forth, and this is what we are, um, the, the, the whole story of the minimal images and the internal interpretation is the, the, the real goal eventually is to be able to identify uh, the, 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 the important visual features and structures which are important for this and thinking about the automatic learning of the, uh, how to extract the internal structure that will be um, uh, support the uh, interpretation of all these interesting and meaningful uh, aspects of images that at the moment we do not have. So, um, okay, let me skip this. Uh, okay, I think I've said, I've said all, of, all of these conclusions already in, in the final comments, so let me stop here.